Welcome back to Behind the Grind, the YouTube and podcast series that explores stories of the personal side of entrepreneurship. I'm your host, Julianne Q, and our guest today is a three-time Canadian national cycling champion who was formerly on Team Canada for sprint track cycling. Growing up, Tegan Cochran was the type of person who would give everything she cared about 110%, whether it was playing hockey to the point of two ACL injuries, getting elected president of her university student union, or graduating with a degree in business administration with honors in marketing. In undergrad, Tegan discovered a love for track cycling and soon became really good at it. By the time she graduated, she had been accepted into Team Canada and she packed her bags and moved to Milton, Ontario, where she would spend the next few years training at the nation's highest levels. Again, Tegan Cochran doesn't do anything at less than 110%. But this story isn't about going after your dreams like that. We know that life is much more nuanced. In many ways, Tegan's story begins in 2018, not when she joined Team Canada, but when she made the decision to leave it. In 2018, she packed her bags and headed back home to turn a new page. What this chapter would look like, she didn't quite know. And for the first time in her life, she was okay with that. So that's how I wanna introduce our next guest. A guest with an incredible history that makes the current chapter of her life that much more meaningful. So without further ado, welcome Tegan Cochran to the show. So. Is there anything you would add to the introduction that I just read? You know what? You you covered it all. Um, you know, in between some of those times at SATE, I uh, explored a few extreme sports like skeleton and Red Bull crash dice. And um, yeah, I think just my nature has always been quite like extreme and always... Um, yeah, just going to be the fastest or... Right. Yeah. Did you actually drive across the country after you... (laughs) I did. Yeah. And it was in the middle of winter. So um, I had packed my bags. I decided that I wanted to uh, leave the Sprint program in Milton. And I packed up my 2003 Toyota Corolla it was jam-packed. I had multiple bikes and all my suitcases. I packed everything up and I drove across the country in February. And the craziest thing was, was that no day was it snowy or bad weather. It was sunny and beautiful, although all cold. All across Canada in All February. across Canada. It was like I was being guided home. Yeah. See, yeah. I'm picturing this whole like picturesque movie moment, which is your life, which is <laughs> crazy. Yeah, that was quite the trip. Yeah. A lot of emotions were happening at that point. I kind of want to sort of bring it back to the beginning. Okay. Because I know your story, but I want want the audience to really get to know and appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And I think that requires some context. So take me back to your days on Team Canada. It seems like in the beginning you knew that you wanted to pursue professional track cycling absolutely I mean it takes that kind of determination and confidence to make it on like team Canada the highest levels for that sport in this country so how did you come to realize like when was the moment that you realized you didn't want to be doing track cycling anymore so I started out cycling I started off on a road bike And my whole life, I grew up in a team sport environment. I played hockey. I played soccer. I was really used to working with other people, and I loved that. Mm -hmm. When I discovered cycling, there was this energy about an individual sport that really attracted me. I was really excited that I would be in control of my destiny. Um... You know, a a common saying in team sports is you're only as good as your worst player. And Mm -hmm. I think sometimes that was hard because no matter what, on a team, you can work as hard as you as hard as you possibly can. But it's also important that all of your other teammates put in that equal effort. Mm -hmm. And I think that with an individual sport, you're really in charge of your destiny. And I wanted to explore that. And so I pursued cycling full on. Um, and sprint cycling is very individualistic and intense. And I loved that at the beginning I was, 
pretty gung-ho. I was finishing my degree and I was traveling back and forth to the velodrome to learn as much as I could in such a short amount of time. And I dove right in. Like my whole life was consumed by cycling. Um, I was basically just studying and riding my bike and training in the gym. And I dedicated years of my life to cycling. And when I had made it to Team Canada, it was this moment of relief. Like I had made it. Um, my previous sporting experience, I had suffered like back to back ACL reconstructions. And for the longest time growing up, I thought that I was going to be a professional hockey player mm -hmm. and go to school and play hockey. And that dream didn't work out. And so when I had made it to the national level in cycling, I felt like my younger self was being fulfilled in this way like okay I felt like oh I had made it and so and of course there's still a long way to go because my goals were not just the national team my goals were the Olympics and right. so I got to Milton and I was immediately immersed in a very intense environment where I was just training six days a week um, multiple training sessions a day and it was all consuming and it was a very isolating lifestyle and my decision to leave was partly because I was struggling with individual sport. I struggled being on my own and not having a team environment and right. to succeed with other people. Um, of course, you have uh, teammates, yeah. but in, you're also competing against them. So you are fighting for that one or two spots mm -hmm. on Team Canada as a sprint cyclist. And of course, you can be happy for your teammates, but in the back of your mind, you know that you're always competing against them. And that was really difficult for me. So what was that program like? I don't know much about mm -hmm. how this, you know, Team Canada is set up. How do you make it into the top ranks? Yeah, so... You start off with provincial championships, um, and then from that level, you go to national championships. And at national championships, the goal is to do well enough that the national team uh, recognizes you and mm -hmm. invites you to a camp. And so I had gone to my first national championships, and I had won a few medals, and they invited me to an integration camp where I went to Milton for two weeks and it was fully intensive. I was doing every training session amongst the Olympians and That's it was so intense. Like I couldn't believe it. I'm like, I have never done this amount of training before at this level. And I think it's more a test as well. I think that they want to see that you can handle that environment, that you can handle the workload and that you're mentally strong enough to withstand that environment. Something that's different from the sprint environment to the endurance environment is that uh, the sprint program was centralized, so we had to live in Milton, whereas the endurance program was decentralized, so you could live in Vancouver and like fly into Milton for camps. Mm -hmm. um, so with the sprint program, it's like, okay, well, if you want to do this, like you really need to be committed. So I had gone for the two-week integration camp, and based on my performance, I was invited full-time onto the national team, which was amazing. I flew back home, I finished my degree, and I drove out like a month later, and um, I started, yeah, my time at, uh, at the Mattamy National Training Center, which is in Milton. Right. And basically a day in the life. Um, you would just wake up early in the morning, everything is calculated, you are eating breakfast at a specific time and it's a specific meal and then you go for your training session and you're at the track cycling for three to four hours then you go home you have lunch and again very specific you're fueling your body at all times and you want to get a rest in and then once you have like a two hour break with food and a rest sometimes a nap you go back for your second training session again three to four hours again on the track or in the gym so that right. was sort of my daily schedule. And how long were you doing this for? So Monday to Friday. And then on Saturdays, we would do a road ride for about four hours. And then on Sundays would be our rest day. And how long, how long did you do this in, until you realized that you didn't want to be doing it anymore? So like, what's the length of time? Oh. I'm just trying to picture. It. Yeah, it was about at the year mark where I was really struggling. Right. I... 
And I also had, I felt like a lot of life experience. I had traveled the world on my own. I had gone to school. I had, I was a little bit older. I was 24 at this time, 25. And I felt like I knew what life was outside of this intensive bubble. Yeah. And I missed that. I missed the balanced lifestyle. I missed the teamwork. I missed, I missed a lot of things. And I was struggling and I pushed through that for a long time. And it basically came to a point where my mental health was really not in a good place. And I had to make the decision to um, look after myself. And what that meant for me was a few things. I wanted to transition into endurance cycling because I love cycling. It's my passion. I it just like filled my heart up. And it was for me when I started cycling, it felt like the sport I was always supposed to do. I just loved it. So I decided I would transition to endurance cycling and move back west and pursue um, road cycling. And and um, that was sort of my decision to leave the program. It was a really difficult one. So now now that you're back west, are you doing endurance cycling? Yeah. So I had left the program and I had signed with two endurance teams. Um, I signed with a, an American team and we would go on a five race circuit, San Francisco, New York, London, Milan and Barcelona, which was going to be like a very exciting mm-hmm. um, adventure for me, which is what I was sort of looking for. I think I was looking to have control again because everything was dictated by coaches and nutritionists when I was in Milton that I was really seeking to gain control. Right. And so doing that or signing with the American team was for me gaining control and doing something that was going to be fun and different. Right. Um, Had you already had an offer? Like I'm thinking back to the moment you decided to pack your bags and leave and drive across yeah. Canada at that moment, had you known that your next steps were going to be endurance cycling? Like, was anything guaranteed? in the works? Yeah, yes. was it? So, I had had an offer a few years prior, mm-hmm. and the day after I left, I reconnected with that person, mm-hmm. and I just said, "I know that this circuit's coming up, and I'm just wondering if you're still looking for riders." And he said, yes, absolutely. And he, I signed the next week. And by the time I came out west, I had already spoken to a local team as well. Um, and I had signed with them. And so I had this American team that was going to be like a fun circuit to re-energize me. And then I had the local women's club that was going to be like my ongoing training. And then from there, my goal was to sign a professional road contract in Mm -hmm. possibly Europe. Right. Mm -hmm. How did it feel, though, leaving such a prestigious institution like Team Canada? Yeah, I had a lot of mixed emotions. I think at the beginning, I mean, it took me months and months and months and months to pull to pull the plug. Mm -hmm. Because it's something that you've dreamt about your whole life. I think from a young girl, I always wanted to be on Team Canada. I wanted to go to the Olympics. And I was getting really close. I was in the place where I I was on the right track. And to walk away from that is extremely frightening. And I think I left a little piece of me in Milton. That like young Tegan who was like dreaming of doing that. And... But I also had this, like, this confidence that it was going to be okay. I I knew that if I really loved cycling, that it would work out and I would find a discipline that fulfilled me because I just knew deep down that I wasn't fulfilled and I just wasn't willing to jeopardize my, my mental health for, you know, three more years until the until the Olympics. Right. Mm -hmm. Where do you think that confidence comes from? Mm. Like, especially as you're stepping into the unknown, obviously nothing is guaranteed. Mm. And to go from such a rigorous schedule where you know exactly how your next day is going to look like to not knowing. That's hard. That's really hard. Um, I think 
I had faced several adversities in my life um, prior to pulling the plug. I had two back-to-back ACL reconstructions, which ended my hockey career. And I picked myself up and moved on and recovered from that. And I think after facing multiple adversities in life, you just learn that things are going to be okay. And although difficult, I sort of knew that it was going to be worth it no matter what. Mm -hmm. And that sort of helped me make the decision. Uh, But of course, it was devastating for, for a period of time because... Yeah, you're walking away from a dream and and it's a choice that you're making. It's not something that happens. It's a it's a choice. Right. And uh and not having that set schedule was was difficult because you're left kind of like I'm so used to people telling me what to do. I'm so used to being on a schedule. I'm so used to being coached. I'm so used to following a meal plan. Everything in my life was calculated. And then you step into the unknown and you're in charge of every aspect of your life. And there's this transition that takes place where you need to decide what you're going to carry forward. Um, you know, what what regimes you like, which ones you don't like, which ones were benefiting you, which ones were hindering you. And it sort of wipes the slate clean and gives you the opportunity to rebuild a new life. Right. And, So it sounds like that was a process for you, leaving and then rebuilding. It's not like you left and then you knew at the very next moment exactly what your next moves were going to be. I had no idea, really. Yeah. I felt like I had put a few pieces together just so I had something, but Mm -hmm. I had no idea what the team in the States would be like. I had no idea what it was going to be like moving again to a new city. I had chosen Vancouver because I always wanted to live here. I grew up in Kelowna and I always wanted to be in Vancouver. So I drove across the country. I landed in Kelowna two, three weeks later, I moved to Vancouver and started new. Right. Mm. You know, I also think that a lot of people get stuck feeling like, okay, I've already invested so much into this one thing. Mm. It doesn't make sense to leave because then what would happen to my investments? This is the sunk cost fallacy. For sure. And I get the impression that the the for the period of time that you were held, that mm-hmm. you maybe like were hesitant to quit and were for thinking sure. it over. I'm I'm sure that that was something that yeah, because you're so close and you've put so much work into something. But no matter what, I think whenever you're dedicating that amount of time and that amount of energy, and you invest so much into something, no matter what, that's going to stay with you. Right. You're not going to lose it if you decide to make a transition or to change path. Mm -hmm. You will always keep those investments and they might just benefit you in a different way in the future, but you're not going to lose them. Right. There's always a benefit that comes from hard work. That's a really good point, actually. So you would you say that you wouldn't lose them because they stay with you in the form of like wisdom or yeah so i mean even for example i do a lot of cycling commercials now and it's not a competitive thing but a lot of the um, a lot of filmmakers who need athletes in their commercials are looking for somebody who has real experience who can you know, handle a bike. And, and so for me now I'm like looking back, I'm like, wow, I would have never been able to succeed in these auditions if I hadn't put in those years of work into cycling. And so it took a while to see the payoffs, but I mean, those happen in so many areas of my life, whether it's business or relationships, that hard work and dedication and drive transitions into so many different things. Yes. You were sort of like, that was a nice segue into one of my next questions for you, which is I've heard that there are a number of similarities between succeeding as an athlete Mm -hmm. and succeeding or what it takes to succeed as an entrepreneur. Yes. Do you think you could touch on that? (laughs) Absolutely. Yeah. The, there is so many similarities. I think the work ethic of elite athletes is, um, yeah, like a hot commodity in the workplace because we're we're very driven and f- task oriented. And for me, that's 
where I thrive in, in the entrepreneurship world, um, I kind of get onto something and I'm going to see it through and I'm going to mm-hmm. stick to it and I'm going to find a solution. And I think that willingness to be uncomfortable is a huge ash- asset in, um, in entrepreneurship because it's not easy. Like transitioning into the business world was difficult for sure, but the skill set that I had made it a lot easier. Right. Um, it's uncomfortable and there's a ton of unknowns when you're starting out a business. You don't know where your next client's going to come from. You don't know if you're doing the right thing. And those are always questions that you, as an athlete, you're asking yourself, am I training the right way? Am I eating the right way? I mean, you lose way more than you win as an athlete. And that's in and what sense? In the sense that every day you're competing against yourself. And so even if it's not a major competition and it's just a training session, there's this you're you're always like, okay, well, what were my times today? And if mm-hmm. they're, you know, they're worse than yesterday or better. It's always this constant grind grind of like, am I improving? Am I moving in the right direction? It's this constant questioning and assessment of yourself and your moves. And I think as an entrepreneur, you need to be very strategic with how Mm -hmm. you spend your energy and your time. And Mm -hmm. I think that elite athletes do that the best. Right. And so that has given me um, a huge head start in as an entrepreneur. Right. Mm. I. It's almost as if like being, for example, when you're an elite athlete, what you're really married to is the process of constantly improving upon yourself yeah. as opposed to any accolades you might get or for achievements. Sure. And I guess in entrepreneurship, you could mm-hmm. sort of picture it the same way. People think it's about you know, all the KPIs and metrics mm-hmm. you might hit, but really it's not. It's it's the process yeah. of continuing to push towards your vision. Mm-hmm. And that is so cool. I wanna I wanna get into this a little bit more because now you have you've got your business consultancy. Mm-hmm. How many years has it been now since you left Team Canada? I can sort of do almost that. two years. Okay. Yeah, almost two years now. In the two years since you left, what are some things that you've learned about yourself? (laughs) Just like personally. Wow. I've learned a lot. Um, Yeah. So I experienced a pretty devastating crash um, when I had moved back west. I crashed in New York City with the American team I was racing for and suffered a compound concussion. Mm -hmm. I lost my front teeth. I had lacerations on my lips and my chins, which I've had to have several surgeries on. I had road rash from head to toe and it effectively ended my high level cycling career. Um, When you have a head injury, it affects your whole life. Mm -hmm. And those were probably the hardest months, possibly year that I've ever had to go through. Mm -hmm. In during that time, I couldn't cycle and I had just given up my spot on Team Canada and moved across the country. Right. So this was last year in the spring? This was the spring of 2018. Right. So a year and a half ago. And uh, yeah, so I had crashed and burned essentially and I had just moved to the city I had only been here for about two months when I had crashed in New York Mm -hmm. and my cycling career had effectively ended that moment and it was recovery time for me um, which was a very difficult process um, emotionally physically mentally everything Mm -hmm. Um, I've had many injuries before but My head injury was devastating. Uh, And I don't think that there's a lot of people who understand because it's not an injury that you can see. Right. It's something that affects your brain and and which affects everything. Right. I I was not able to sleep properly. My emotions were all over the place. I had bouts of anxiety and depression. I was really struggling. And 
the timing of this. Yeah. I think, like, just me trying to picture it now, and the timing must have been so devastating because you had just left everything. Like, when you thought your world, your your path was going to go a certain way, yeah. you left all that certainty, the prestigious institution, et cetera, et cetera. And just months later, not even two months into settling into a new city, you get into a, a career-ending crash. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. And I think that there was a there was a period of time where I felt really angry. I felt like, wow, I took the risk to change disciplines because I thought it would be more fulfilling to me. And this is what happens? Like the, I was devastated. Right. Because it was my passion. It was my career. It was everything and all of a sudden I'm left with nothing. Mhm. What well, felt like nothing at the time. It's not nothing now, but it felt like nothing. I was by myself in a new city, and I was left with the question of what now? Like, I can't train anymore. I need to get my head better. I need, you know, surgeries to remove rocks from my lips. I need to see a concussion specialist. I need to fix my neck injury because my whiplash was so severe. I, it was a process, but I had to put one foot in front of the other. And then that overwhelming feeling of like, oh my gosh, like I have to make money because the moment I crashed, I, Team Canada cut my carding. So I was no longer being, you know, receiving money. And it was having to make the decision of like, am I going to stay in this new city or do I, you know, put my tail between my legs and go home and recover and have the support of my family. Um, and I decided to stay and stick it out. Yeah. I would have thought you would have, you know, gone home. Yeah. I think I mean, there was moments I think I should have. Like, <laughs> at this point in your story, you deserve to go back home. So I'm like, why... But then, then again, this is you. Yeah, so. but I just felt like I'm like, no, I was so stubborn at that point. Like, I was stubborn. I'm like, I made the decision to come out, out west and start a new life and feel fulfilled in, in, my, in my passion. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving up now. Like, right. <laughs> there's no way. So what was the recovery like here then? Oh, it was awful. It was really, I, yeah, I mean... With head injuries, you can't be in stimulated environments. So, you know, I couldn't be in loud noises. I couldn't deal with heavy conversations. I couldn't deal with music. I could hardly read. I, like I said, like the anxiety and depression that I was experiencing were on levels I had never, ever had before. And I think a lot of elite athletes struggle with mental health issues because it's, a really intense environment and we're usually type A personalities and it can be a really isolating lifestyle. And I think there's a lot of athletes who experience depression and anxiety, mm -hmm. but after my head injury, that was taken to a new level for sure. And, um, I just kind of had to figure it out and, and I luckily was connected with an incredible concussion specialist named Dr. Siglet. And he helped me a lot. And we laugh now because I think every appointment for the first like five, four months, I would go in just crying because I had no like emotional control. And I was up and down and all around. And, and it was just a process. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. Yeah. Concussions are hard. I've never had one and I never ever want to know what yeah. it's like. You mentioned something about mental health and athletes. I feel like that's something people rarely ever talk about. Like even when you mentioned it just now, it's like it sounds to me like like a paradox. Mm -hmm. So did you have resources to support you with regards to your mental health when you were on Team Canada? Yes. Yes, we did. So we had access to sports psychologists, mm -hmm. um, which I used regularly mm -hmm. um, to cope with the stress of competing, to cope with the stress of competing within your team mm -hmm. um, and being 
completely immersed in the environment without any escape, it felt like. Right. That that I needed support for, for mm-hmm. sure. And then after your your injury, yeah. um, did you can were you able to continue yes. getting help with your mental health? For sure. Um it took me some time. Um I think like the initial shock of my injury, I had to like kind of let that settle in for mm-hmm. A few months. I think that I was in denial for sure. Um, and if you refer to like the the grief cycle, denial is a huge part. And I honestly didn't even see a concussion specialist until like three months post crash because I was angry and in denial. And I didn't want to think that it was going to be as bad as it was. Like I just wanted to get back on my bike and continue to like strive for signing a pro endurance contract. What finally prompted you to see a concussion specialist? I had some, pre- I had loved ones around me who were encouraging me to look after it because it was affecting me on a daily basis. And mm-hmm. um, I would consider myself a fairly stable person, um, level headed. And I think I was, yeah, it was a very turbulent time for me. And so with that love and kindness, from my loved ones, I was connected to the right people. And uh, I began that recovery process a little bit more in depth. And I just made a commitment to myself that it was worth the investment to look after myself. So I got a counselor, I was working with my concussion specialist, massage therapist, and I, whatever money I was able to make, I was basically putting towards my recovery. Right. Mm -hmm. Was it also during this time that you started what is now your business, but your business in its first iteration Mm -hmm. used to look a little different. So now you're, you're you're in the business of, I guess, management consultant and, and, um, helping enterprises scale and become more efficient. Absolutely. But in the beginning, what was it that you were doing? Yeah, so in the beginning, it was more focused on web design and branding. And I my degree is in marketing, So, and I also studied um, design. So it was sort of a natural transition for me. And after my, my injury, I needed to A, make money, and B, have a job that was going to be flexible enough with my recovery because... I was not able to sustain normal energy levels like I was. I mean, I could focus for maybe a few hours before I had to take a break Mm -hmm. and rest my brain. And then, so doing web design was, I mean, it was tough because I had to look at a computer, but I needed to make money from home. And so I needed to find a way to do that. And with all of the um, amazing resources that are available these days, Um, I just sort of grasped onto web design. I thought it was a a fun, creative outlet. I could also help businesses package themselves um, and help them position in the market that they desired. So it was really great. I felt like I was immediately thrown back into the business world. I had a creative outlet, which was really healthy for me at the time. Um, And so it was sort of a natural... I don't even know. I just, I just happened. I just, right. I needed to make money and look after myself and, and I didn't want to go home. Mm-hmm. So I, I made it work and I started off with, um, yeah, the web design and branding. And then that's just naturally progressed as I've healed and as I've been able to have more energy levels and, and use my brain a lot more, it's naturally progressed into what it is today. So how did you make the transition from branding and web design yeah. to what you're doing now? We, we had a conversation before uh, we started taping, and it seems like the projects you're working on now are, like, huge, like three to six months, as opposed to, like, you know, individual web design projects, which is what you were doing last year, I think. Yeah, so the transition, it was kind of funny, because I remember a moment specifically where... I knew that I was more valuable than what I was doing because I'm not a developer. I'm not a coder. So I was able to make websites, but just, you know, helping small businesses get off the ground. And um, I was like, okay, this is good for now. But I remember meeting with a client and as we were talking, 
he was sort of telling me things about his business that he was having issues with. And in my mind, I'm like, wow, I think that I can help you. And on top of helping him with his website, it naturally involved to so much more Mm -hmm. where, you know, he was having issues with motivating employees or, you know, having his employees being in the right role or he wanted to be um, in a specific market, but he was having a hard time transitioning into that. And so we started off with the web design and I naturally just sort of plucked away at these other issues. And it was that contract that really changed things for me. Um, And without him as well, giving me the opportunity to explore Mm -hmm. um, those other consulting roles. um, Yeah, I mean, there's always a catalyst, right? There's always somebody who sort of helps you with that transition. Um, And that was one for me that sticks out because... You know, as I was introducing some systems to help with their project management and and as I was creating documents like standard operating procedures and employee handbooks and Mm -hmm. organizing the foundation of his business that he could scale, I really started to feel like I was in my place. Right. Because as an athlete, I specialized in getting places as quickly and efficiently as possible. I would have to assess the whole environment and find the right path. Mm -hmm. And I think as a consultant, that's very much what we do. We Mm -hmm. go into businesses and we help them find solutions that are A, going to work and B, are efficient in both time and money. Right. Right. So yeah, it was this natural progression. And I started to shift away from more of that remote work at home and started to be involved in more on-site contracts where I was immersing myself fully into these businesses and helping them scale and achieve the goals that they had set out for themselves. Right. So now, do you think you've found your your thing? Absolutely. Yeah. That's awesome. I know. It's it, And it's taken time, but... Um, I love it. I, you know, and it's a, I, I tell people all the time, like when I start a contract, it's a very intense process because we uncover a lot within the business and systems are very finicky things. Um, they are crucial to your business and you need to be implementing smart systems. Mm-hmm. And so that is where I'm thriving is going into these businesses essentially auditing every system they have in place, whether it's team communication, document sharing, inventory systems, point of sale systems. Every system that's involved in a business needs to be integrated and smart and work for that business. And a lot of the time, people will introduce systems just out of convenience or because they have to. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily the right system for them. Um, so I kind of come in and, and help them reorganize and build a foundation that they can scale from. Right. Yeah, no, it's great that, that you now are in a place where you can put your strengths and your knowledge base to work. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's crazy to think that it's only been two years for you to have built yourself on a new path and get to the point where you're like rather established now, I think. And just two years ago, making such a huge transition. Yeah. What's next for you in your business? So right now I'm currently working on a project that is so fulfilling and exciting for me. I'm learning about my business and myself Mm -hmm. on a daily basis. Um, And I think that as an entrepreneur, you're constantly in a state of refinement. You're Mm -hmm. always making sure that what you're doing is right for you, for your business. And the same way that I'm going in and auditing and helping introduce systems and structures for businesses to be efficient and scale, I also need to be doing that to my own business. And so whatever comes next is next. I, for the first time in my life, don't have this massive dream for my business, I'm letting it progress naturally. And I've never done that before because I've always been super goal oriented and super driven and had set my height, my sights super high. Mm -hmm. And I think for a long time, if I didn't meet that goal, it was really devastating for me. Mm -hmm. 
And I also think that I would rush a lot of those processes. I think that even with my cycling, I was really gung ho. And I think I rushed into my discipline too quickly because I just wanted to get there. I wanted to be a champion. I wanted to find the fastest way onto Team Canada. And I didn't think about what discipline was the right one for me, for my body, for my mind, for my ability. And if I would have taken more time, I think that my choices would have been different. Mm -hmm. I don't regret my choices, but I think by taking the time, you can really discover what it is you need. And so for the first time in my life with my business, I feel like I'm taking my time and I'm allowing it to evolve naturally. And yes, I still do business development and I still am driven and, um, you know, very focused. Right. But I'm not being so hard on myself. And I think that that's been a game changer for me is it alleviates a ton of pressure from myself to just be who I am mm-hmm. and, and to be aligned with your core values. Absolutely. Those are the things intrinsic to you that mm-hmm. never change. Mm-hmm. And I would imagine your business's core values are similar For to sure. your own personal core values. Absolutely. So just for the audience, yeah. what are some of your values? Well, some of my values are commitment. Absolutely. Um, And every project that I do, I am 100% in. Uh, Similar to all of my other endeavors in life, like I'm pretty focused, but I really value commitment and honesty. And so when I agree to a project, I feel like I'm a part of their team for however long it is. And I want to do the best possible job. And I genuinely want every business I work for to succeed. And so that is a value for me that I I hold very strongly in my business and in my life. I'm very committed individual, you know, relationally, personally. um, And that's a that's a value for me. I value integrity, following through with what you say you're going to do. I think it's just really important to to say and do what you what you said you were going to do. Um, right. Cuz that becomes your brand. It becomes your brand. Absolutely. And and being honest about about what it is you can do and want to do is also very important and I think ties into integrity because I think there's a lot of people who will say yes, yes, yes and then you know, in the moment where they think about it and they're like, you know what, maybe that doesn't align for me. Maybe that I should have said no, or maybe I don't really want to do this or I don't have the time to do this. I think that being honest in business is important for me and in my life um, about and being okay to say no. Mm -hmm. And I think some people are afraid to be honest because they don't think the truth is enough, mm -hmm. especially the people who think like, the fake it till you make it crowd. Um, I think, so, because I'm a huge nerd, I happen to know that there are two major, like, approaches to ethics. Mm -hmm. There's the consequentialist approach, which is the ends justify the means. Mm -hmm. And then there's the, I don't know, remember the name for it, but it's basically what you're you're doing, which is starting off with your principles Mm -hmm. and then letting that be your guide. Absolutely. And I think that, yeah, that is how, you know, I think to a certain extent in business, there is that unknown that you have to push yourself into Mm -hmm. where sometimes you do have to say yes, because you have a belief that you can do it, even if you haven't done it before. Right. I think that you, for me, at least I do still put myself in those unknowns at times, but I know that if I say I'm going to do it, I'm going to follow through and I'm going to do my best. Mm -hmm. And so that is a little bit of that, you know, we'll call it fake it till you make it, but you're, you're basing it on your abilities and your confidence to complete that task, not based on you trying to please other people. Yes. So the, but the other side of it, of course, like being guided by your principles is, yeah, I I love that. I like fundamental. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm realizing now, I think, well, 
I'm realizing now that the world is much too complicated to think that you can just start at the finish line and then know exactly what to do yeah. to work backwards. I think it's just so much easier if you are true to yourself mm-hmm. and you know operate as a person of integrity mm-hmm. and then just trust that it all works out. Yeah. But I think that takes, for some people, it might take a little bit of time to learn. Yeah. Um, so now we are getting to our last question. Okay. And this is a question that I like to ask um, all of my guests. Okay. If you could go back in time and if you could speak to the version of you five years ago and offer one piece of advice, what would it be? Take your time. And allow yourself to enjoy the process. I think that's what I would say to myself. I have been very streamlined and focused the majority of my life towards a goal. And I think at times I haven't enjoyed the process. Mm -hmm. And so the effect of that is when you finally make it, it's not nearly as great as you think it's going to be because you haven't enjoyed any step of the way. And I know it sounds like, you know, pretty cliche, but it is about enjoying what you're doing. And I think that is tied into being intrinsically motivated rather than extrinsically motivated. And you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier, but when you're extrinsically motivated and all you care about is the goal and getting there and being there and having this achievement, you're not going to be happy when you get there. And speaking from experience, I knew because when I had, you know, had three gold medals at national championships, I was standing up on that podium and I was like, wow, I thought this was going to feel way better than it did. It didn't feel good at all. And that was because every day I was just like, I just want to get there. I just want to get there. I just want to get there. And I wasn't like in, enjoying the everyday grind or, or process of, wow, appreciating that I was improving every day or appreciating right. the commitment from coaches. And, and so I really was not intrinsically motivated at, at that point. Um, and that is the transition I've made now to enjoy my business every day and my life every day rather than focusing on that end goal and being like, well, I'll be happy when I get there. No, I don't, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to feel uh, that way anymore. I love, I love the way that you framed that. I think we're going to end there. Okay. That was a beautiful way of Um, ending all of this. Thank you so much for being here for this episode and for providing all those golden nuggets. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate you. Oh, thanks. (laughs) So that was Tegan Cochran of Spectrum.